What are we doing today? No chalk, cleans, in flats. You see how high I had to lift the camera up there to get eye level with you? There you go, cool. All right guys, Sonny Webster here. We're gonna go absolutely mental in the gym. We're in Austin. Austin's a great place, especially if you wanna get a good workout in. With no chalk. No chalk. No tape. No tape. <laughs> Is that what we did today? Snatches. Definitely, definitely not gonna clean. <laughs> Haven't done any cleans today. <laughs> we tried to do cleans without any chalk in a sweaty, moist gym. I've got hands of a five-year-old girl. Zach's got bigger hands, and he's still struggled. All right, so uh, I'm actually stoked to be doing jerks because I think it's a simple movement in the sense of going shoulder to overhead is much easier to grasp. There's no stage of the pull or anything like that. But it becomes difficult for people um, when the weight gets heavy because of timing and usually footwork. So my two biggest rules in, in the jerk by far are uh, in the timing. So you want to dip, usually dip slower than you drive or drive faster than you dip. So a lot of times you'll see people, they'll dip really fast and they'll have so much force coming down on them that the drive will be slower. And we wanna go up, so why would we go down faster than we go up? Um, an another time that, that happens too is like, people may be too slow to turn around, they pause too long in, in this bottom position of the drive. And then footwork, man, if you can get your back foot to land first, it's, it solves a lot of issues. Back foot lands first, and then the final thing we'll talk about, just these three things, is trying to get your heel in line with your knee so that your vertical, so your fib tip is vertical, or even better, your knee is behind your heel. The moment you get a millimeter in front, things start coming forward, you're not as stable. Uh, you want to have just as much force pushing you back as this foot pushes you forward so you're stable in the middle. If you're here, you have unequal balance pushing you together. And that's it. A couple of things that are really important for me when I'm thinking about my setup for my jerk is ensuring that I create a good platform. So what I'm doing when I unrack the bar, especially from a rack, is bringing my shoulders up and forward so it's off my windpipe. The other thing that I do, which may be different, is Zach would be interested to see his thoughts with it as well, is I make sure that I've got the bar in the full grip of my hand. Because the thing is, when I'm in my overhead position, right, if I've got the bar in my fingertips here in the setup, and I then take the bar up overhead in that same position, it's gonna hit me on the head. So at some point, I'm gonna have to close my hands from here to here when I'm throwing it overhead in order to catch it. Just by simplifying the fact that the bars in the palm of the hand right from the start makes it much sharper into my lockout position. The other thing that I'm focusing on a lot in the jerk is ensuring that throughout the dip and drive, the elbows stay still. 
if at all the elbows drop during the bottom phase of the dip, which happens a lot, you're gonna start using the arms, which is gonna make it very difficult to do the things that Zach just said about that front leg positioning when in the split here. You're so long. I really like what's happening there with Zach's front front leg. He's really sharp with that and like his position of his shin bone as well. Absolutely perfect. But I feel sorry for him because he's so fucking long. His arms are long, his legs are long. My arms are like a T-Rex, so it's never an issue for me doing jerks. That one I do, it's kind of called like a touch and go jerk. It's a fantastic drill. Um, do it with lightweight. Probably wasn't warm enough to do that, but What's the essentially idea what you're doing it? is you bring it down and you take that dip and go right into the next one. I don't know why, but it helps with the timing. It's like you're forcing yourself to put more into the bar because you're you're not setting up and thinking about the dip and drive. You have to drive. How to dip? Fantastic. At what point do you normally go to singles? What lap percentage? Or uh, what normal rep ranges you'd work on a jerk? Uh, I I personally really like threes. So like work like when I was. When I did my best split jerking, 182, my favorite workout was like five, six, six sets of three at 130 to 150. And that's probably what, 75%, 75, 80%. That's generally where weightlifting is. Yeah. Like there's, there's no magic uh, program. It's like usually 75, 80%, and then every once in a while you stretch it out, see what you can do. But that's just generally weightlifting as a whole. Nice. Oh, I missed it. And people with long arms generally will say, oh, do I need to have my hands wider when I'm jerking? What's your thought? I, I, I do that for sure. Yeah. The, the reason for it is the timing works out, right? If the bar has to travel a lot longer, the, the timing between my feet when they settle and when the bar settles might be too long. Mm. You want it to be your feet settle, but your arms are already ready for that. Yeah. Like right, so, this is like the coolest part about the split jerk to me, okay? Your back foot, it kind of just anchors. The moment that your front foot hits, there needs to be tension in the body. So it's like the back foot just kind of sets this anchor, then the front foot hits. At that time when it hits, you're, you're catching and there's no movement in the weight, right? If you have other, if, if there are other faults throughout that, a lot of times like, the front foot might hit, then the weight comes down. Or the front foot might hit and you're still trying to lock out. So for me, what I found is wide grip helps me with timing, but where I give up, right, the wider your grip goes, the harder it is to hold weight overhead, right? It's much easier to hold 200 kilos overhead in this plane right here than it is in that plane. Yeah. There we go. The split jerk is surprisingly one of the hardest things to warm up, neurologically speaking. Okay, like my CNS to get fired up for the split jerk, it takes a lot. So like when I do split jerks from the rack, just bringing it down and having to brace against that and doing multiple reps, that wakes my nervous system up. You would think like, okay, because it's smaller muscle groups supporting the weight, that you don't have to do that many. You can just do singles the whole time. But what I found is when I do more doubles, I get this like, it's hard to explain. You know what I'm talking about? Like you, you feel like your CNS is warm. It's not just like your body is warm. The last time I've PR'd my jerks have either come from clean and jerking. So I clean and jerk and then I would switch to just yeah, doing jerk or front squat jerk. So front squat jerk is 
one of the most underrated workouts in weightlifting, period. Period. So what's your uh, training and competition jerk? So my best jerk from a rack is 215 kilos and my best clean and jerk is 200 kilos but I'd always say that you should be able to keep 10% in the bag from a jerk out of a rack to warrant being able to do it after a clean. Um, so I think it's a good thing to always train past where your best clean and jerk is anyway to allow for the fatigue that you'd have after doing a heavy clean. So I've always kept that barrier and do you know what one of the biggest things for me when I was working towards doing a 200 clean and jerk, bearing in mind I could jerk 215 probably three years before I clean and jerk 200 kilos. And it wasn't that I couldn't jerk the weight, I was strong enough to do that, but I couldn't do it under fatigue. So for me, the biggest thing was actually working on making my clean easier past the 200. So I could not just do 200, but do 200 clean easy so that I had enough energy and reserve to do the jerk. And that's when I utilized as well front squat jerks a lot yeah. and clean front squat, front squat jerk yep. to practice jerking under fatigue because it's a completely different ball game than doing it out of a rack like we're doing today or off blocks. Lovely. There's a point in your training, and this is probably for more advanced people, where the rubber really meets the road. Like, <laughs> clean and jerk training is a scary thing. So, like, there, there's a level of fitness necessary for the clean and jerk that's very different than the snatch. Especially when you start becoming very technically sound in the clean and jerk, meaning the load that you use is much higher. And in order to train that without killing yourself, the front squat jerk is a really good substitute. You're like, yeah. today I've got clean front squat jerk at 90% and up. Like I'm scared of that, you know? And then that's when front squat jerk sessions are also scary because it's like, this is where I grow. It's not the clean and jerk sessions. I don't get better at clean and jerking from clean and jerk. Sound. But this is one of the things to me that differs the longer you've been training for. Like one of the biggest mistakes I see beginners make when it comes to programming their first training session is they try and add in too much exercise variation when they haven't actually mastered the fundamentals of the classical movement. Whereas when you become an elite level lifter where you're technically proficient in the classical movement, you're actually trying to work the small little weaknesses within the overall movement that need training separately as opposed to actually training at the high intensity on the classical movement. Because for an elite level weightlifter to do snatch and clean and jerk every single week when they're technically proficient, 80% gives the body an absolute pounding and you'd quickly get injured. However, for a beginner to do snatch and clean and jerk every single week when they're lifting nowhere near their strength potential, they will get away with it and build good consistent movement patterns with the classical movement. And that's one thing you've got to remember when you're watching an elite level lifter train and how they program their sessions versus how you should with just one or two years of experience, different approach. So Zach, you've just put your belt on now. What percentage are we of your best? The way I think about the belt is different than many people. I actually do like putting on the belt early. Um, when I was at my strongest, I put on the belt earlier. I love that. But I would lift for cycles, entire cycles without a belt. I just, it didn't really matter, but I felt like I was technically proficient enough to be like, all right, my best clean at the top, at, at my best was 180. Yeah. I put on the belt at like 120. Because sometimes even when I've got a belt on, yeah, it's not done up as tight as it could go, but it's just reminding me to brace, like, and I normally put my belt on around 50% or upwards, but I yeah. don't necessarily have it done up super tight. It's just me, keeping me aware to brace. It, yeah, it's like, it's like no more f***ing around. So we got around 140 something kilos. Jim's got everything, but they don't got a belt. Don't <laughs> talk. <laughs> Can you not roll back a jerk? Yeah, I'm gonna roll back it. Okay. Send it. 
sleigh, dance, giraffe legs. Soul sucker. Easy. <laughs> yes, good lad. That I'm doing pulls now. What's like the key thing you think about when you're doing a pull? The most important thing. You can sum up in a nutshell. Yeah, your your start needs to be the, the same as you would on a clean. And the tempo and like generally the tempo. Sometimes you can get really heavy and, and you'll slow down, but the whole thing is just maintaining position with overload. So like being able to lift more than your max clean, maintaining the exact same positions as your clean. Sometimes people can do cleans where they can, like clean pools where they can make contact and then kind of use their arms to finish. I would say that's different. It's usually not going to be too much of an overload. And then there's some people that kind of like touch and then they do like a little shrug and a tiny little pull with arms. That's more the overloaded clean pull. So just like Zach said, key things I'm focusing on when I'm doing a pull is making sure that in the initial phase from the floor, I don't lose position, so I don't fall out of position, which is one of the key things that people do wrong. But also, just like Zach said as well, change speed through the middle. It doesn't matter how fast for me it comes off the floor, as long as it changes speed when it comes past the knee. So you're actually better sometimes reserving a little bit in that first initial pull, like squeezing off the floor. If you can accelerate through the middle, that's what's gonna allow the bar to continue to accelerate and give you the time to move underneath into your receiving position, not the speed from the floor. Zach, what percentage should you do your pulls at? Well, it depends, you know, uh, there's, there's different styles. Like I was saying before, like if you're trying to simulate the really finish, like, like finishing and maybe even using the arms, then you would treat it like any other clean day. So you might do anywhere from 80% to like 100% of your clean. But if you're trying to do overloading training, I usually try to go 110% or 120%. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's usually where you're gonna go with clean pulls. Like you're gonna go heavy, you're allowed to go heavy. It's just, it's something that can give you confidence off the floor, so, so yeah, go overload. Aye. 